So let's talk about your role in uh, providing for nutrition and hydration needs of residents. So this introduces you to the basic principles of nutrition. It includes the ChooseMyPlate.gov, therapeutic diets, adaptive devices, alternative methods of feeding, providing drinking water and nourishments, feeding a resident, and measuring and recording intake and output. So food is broken down by the GI or gastrointestinal system into small substances that we call nutrients. Nutrients are absorbed into the body for its use by the body. So we have protein, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, minerals, and of course water. So protein is job is to build and repair tissue. The carbohydrate supplies fuel for the body's energy needs and supplies fiber, which is necessary for bowel elimination. Fat is a source of stored energy. It helps the body use certain vitamins, conserves your body heat, protects the internal organs from injury, and it also holds your kidneys in place. Vitamins are necessary for carrying out and maintaining specific body functions. Minerals are necessary for carrying out and maintaining specific body functions as well. So water is the most essential nutrient for life. Without it, a person can only live for a few days. Water assists in digestion and absorption of food and it helps the body to maintain a normal temperature. It is the largest component of blood plasma. So no one food contains all the nutrients that you need for good health. So eating a variety of foods is needed to sustain positive health. So there are nutrition guidelines and they're typically divided foods into food groups and are recommended daily servings of each group for a healthy diet. A food group is a collection of foods that shared similar nutritional properties or biological classifications. So the vegetable group, about half your plate should be fruits and vegetables. You should see at least five different colors and eat five different fruits and vegetables per day. So you need to make at least a quarter of your plate grains and they should be whole grains and then the other quarter should be protein and then it should be lean protein so a 51 year old needs about five and a half ounces daily for men and five ounces for women and then we have the dairy group so people should switch to fat free or low fat milk so men and women over 51 need three cups of dairy each day So dietary guidelines for Americans, there are two overarching concepts. So to maintain calorie balance over time, to achieve and sustain a healthy weight, and we need to know that a calorie is a unit of energy. <clears throat> so five pounds of spaghetti is similar to brewing and drinking a whole pot of coffee, and all the way down. So another overarching concept focuses on consuming nutrient-dense foods and beverages. So foods that have high nutritional content also have high energy. Empty calories are contained in food that provide fuel, but few or no nutrients, such as a candy bar, a Rice Krispie treat. Factors that influence your caloric need are your age, your sex, be it male or female, your size and activity level, the climate you live in, the state of your own health, and the amount of sleep that you get. Effects of good nutrition are to promote physical and mental health, increase your resistance to illness, produce additional energy and vitality, it aids in healing, assists you to feel and sleep better. So some signs of good nutrition are healthy, shiny looking hair, clean skin and bright eyes, a well-developed healthy body, an alert facial expression, and an even and pleasant disposition. If you think about it, if you don't eat breakfast, by 11 o'clock in the morning, you're pretty grumpy. 
Also, good nutrition helps you to have restful sleep patterns, promotes a healthy appetite, regular elimination habits, and an appropriate body weight. Poor nutrition, on the other hand, we see people with hair and their eyes appear dull, they have irregular bowel habits, the weight fluctuates, we also can see osteoporosis and other diseases. Patients have a lack of interest, which equals a mental slowdown, and their skin color and appearance are actually poor. Anemia is a sign of poor nutrition, or it can be a blood disorder, which it is, but you can feel, uh, have feelings of being tired, short of breath, an elevated pulse rate, which is tachycardia, problems with digestion, pale skin, and poor sleep patterns, and oftentimes headaches. So nutritional challenges that affect our elderly residents, the metabolism slows down, the muscles then weaken, the body moves slower, activities reduced, and with reduced activity, we have a decreased appetite. Loss of vision affects the way food looks, which can decrease your appetite as well. The aging process and some medications weaken the sense of smell and taste, which also decrease our appetite. The elderly have less saliva production, which affects their ability to chew and to swallow. Dentures and poor dental hygiene often make it difficult to chew as well. So in the elderly, digestion takes longer and it's not nearly as efficient. Constipation can interfere with your appetite. If you feel bloated or full, you're not necessarily hungry. Things that affect our dietary practices or personal preference, some people prefer steak to chicken, other people prefer chicken to steak, your appetite, your ability to pay for the food that you choose, illness, and cultural preferences. So some culture and dietary practices, diets of Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, and those from the Far East often include rice and tea, versus diets of Spanish speaking include spicy type dishes, which also contain rice, beans, and corn. The Italian diet oftentimes includes spaghetti, lasagna, and other type pastas versus the Scandinavians that have lots of fish in their diets. We Americans eat a lot of meat and fast food and processed foods. Use of sauce and spices are culturally related. For example, um, in the Southwest, you may actually see food a little bit more spicy than you would have it here on the East Coast. So culture and dietary practices, some cultures have days of fasting when all or certain foods are avoided. So the Christian science religion avoids coffee, tea, and alcohol. Roman Catholics avoid food one hour before communion, and they observe special days where they fast and don't eat. A lot of times the Muslims avoid alcohol and pork products. The Seventh-day Adventists avoid alcohol, coffee, tea, pork, some meats, and caffeine. The Baptist religion typically avoid coffee, tea, and alcohol. Greek Orthodox usually fast for days, but usually are forgiven when they're ill and need to eat. The Jewish faith, conservative Jewish faith, prohibits shellfish, non-kosher meats such as pork, and requires special utensils for food preparation. Forbids cooking on the Sabbath, which is Sunday, and forbids eating of leavened bread during Passover. Also, it forbids serving milk and milk products with meat. Strict rules are made regarding sequence in which milk products and meat can be consumed. So let's talk about modified diets. So modified diets help body organs to maintain or regain their normal function. They treat metabolic disorders by regulating the amount of food and the type of food. You can add or eliminate calories to cause a change in body weight. Assists with digestion of food by taking foods out of the diet that irritate the digestive system. For example, if you are lactose intolerant, you don't want anything with milk products. Also, there can be a restrictive salt, which is sodium intake, to prevent or decrease edema, which is swelling. 
Some of our residents will have clear liquid, full liquid, bland, low residue, controlled carbohydrate or a diabetic diet, low fat, low cholesterol diets, high fiber, low calorie, high calorie, sodium restricted, salt protein, mechanical soft, chopped, or pureed diets. You need to look at the diet card and on that card should be the resident's name and information about their diet, their food allergies, and the things that they like and dislike. Low sodium diets are specifically for those with high blood pressure, heart disease, kidney disease, or retention may be placed on a low sodium diet. Salt packets won't be on the food tray. Common abbreviations for this are NAS, which means no added salt, and low NA, which means low sodium. <coughs> <clears throat> Low protein diets are typically for our residents with severe kidney disease who may be on this type of diet. Proteins break down into substances that can harm the kidneys. The extent of protein restriction will vary depending on the stage of the kidney disease. Fluid restriction, usually for residents with severe heart or kidney disease, may need fluid restriction. For these residents, we need to make sure we measure and document the exact amounts of fluid they take in and report that to the nurse. Don't offer additional fluids or foods that contain fluid. Notify the nurse if the resident is complaining of thirst. The common abbrevi abbreviation for this type of diet is RF. So low fat, low cholesterol diets. Residents with high levels of cholesterol, gallbladder disease, or diseases that interfere with digestion of fat and liver disease may be placed on this type of diet. The diet permits skim milk, low-fat cottage cheese, fish, white meat of turkey or chicken, veal, and vegetable fats. Typically, the use of mono-unsaturated fats such as olive oil, canola oil, and peanut oil is encouraged. Do not offer this resident additional fluids or foods that contain fluid. Notify the nurse if they say they're thirsty or hungry. The common abbreviation is low-fat and low-cal. A modified caloric diet means that we're reducing the calories to help the person lose weight or gain weight. Don't offer residents on a low-cal diet extra food. Make sure you check with the nurse. So our residents with diabetes, calories and carbohydrates are carefully controlled. Fats and proteins are regulated. Amounts of food are determined by energy needs. Diabetics typically need to eat the food that's served on the tray because we give them medication to account for what's on the tray. Don't offer other foods without a nurse's approval. The meal tray may contain artificial sweeteners such as Sweet and Low, Splenda, or Equal. And common abbreviations for diabetic diets are NCS or ADA. Modified diets of consistency can be a liquid diet, a soft and mechanical soft diet, or a pureed diet. Liquid diets are ordered for short term for medical conditions or before or after a test for surgery or surgery. Liquid food is anything that is in the form of a liquid state at room temperature. So some things that are clear liquids are clear juices, broth, gelatin, and popsicles. Full liquids could be cream soups, milk, and ice cream. Soft and mechanical soft diets make food easier to chew and to swallow. Soft diets include high fiber foods, fried foods, spicy foods, raw vegetables, and fruits and some meats will be restricted. Food is chopped or blended versus the mechanical soft where food choices are not limited and only the texture of the food is changed. A pureed diet does not require that a resident chew his or her food. The food is chopped, blended, or ground into a thick paste of baby food consistency. So you need to make sure that you serve the right resident, the right tray, with the right diet, at the right temperature, in the right environment, with the right attitude. So things that can be used to take in nutrients, adaptive devices can be food guards, divided plates, built up handled utensils, easy grip mugs and glasses. Residents have to be taught how to use these devices. Oftentimes, parenteral fluids, which is intravenous infusion, IV, can be administered through the vein. IVs help hydrate, but have very little nutritional value. 
This is the responsibility of a licensed nurse. Things that you, the nursing assistant or nursing assistant student, need to report is if there is a near empty bottle or bag, the change that needs to be made in a drip rate, you cannot make the change, pain at a needle insertion site, redness or swelling, or loose, non-intact or damp dressing. <clears throat> Enteral feedings. It's a liquid formula administered into the stomach through a tube by a licensed nurse. The tube can go nose to the stomach, which is called a nasogastric tube. It can go directly into the stomach, which is called a gastrostomy tube or a PEG tube, which is a percutaneous endoscopic gastronomy. Mitts may be ordered to prevent the resident from dislodging their tubes. This is a type of PEG tube, and it goes into the stomach. <coughs> Residents who are unable to take nutrients by mouth can consent to enteral feedings. Those that are depressed or comatose, swallowing problems from strokes or Alzheimer's or other medical conditions, or even those who've had disorders of their digestive tract. We need to make sure that there are no tension or tube on the tubings, no kinks or coils, and the tube is not underneath the resident. When we bathe them, we need to be very careful to make sure when we roll or turn a patient that we do not cause this to happen. Make sure we keep the resident's nose clean and free of mucus and keep the tube secure. Perform frequent oral care with patients who have a nasogastric or a PEG tube. Things to report. Redness or drainage around the opening. Skin sores or bruising. Cyanotic or bluish colored skin. Residents' complaints of chest pain or nausea. Feeling like they're choking. The tube comes out. The feeding pump alarm sounds. The resonance inclined position changes. So hydration. So under normal conditions, most of us need about eight eight ounce glasses of water a day. We consume two and a half to three and a half quarts daily between eating and drinking. And then we eliminate the exact same from urine, perspiration, water vapor through our respirations, and stool. So edema is too much fluid in the body versus dehydration where there's too little fluid in the body. Edema is fluid intake exceeds the fluid output therefore causing fluid retention. This can be caused by kidney failure, heart failure, and excessive salt intake. Some signs of edema is weight gain, swelling of the feet ankles, hands, fingers, and face, decreased urine output, shortness of breath, and the collection of fluid in the abdomen, which is called ascites. That is why it's important that our resonance weights are accurate, because fluid retention can be detected by weight gain. So fluid output exceeds fluid intake. This is a common problem of our elderly long-term care residents. Some signs of dehydration include thirst, decreased urine output, parched or cracked lips, dry cracked skin, a fever, weight loss, concentrated urine, or the tongue is coated and it looks thick. Poor fluid intake, diarrhea, vomiting, bleeding, excessive perspiration are all causes of dehydration. So special fluid orders could be force fluids, which means to encourage the resident to drink more fluids. Restrict fluids means to limit the amount of fluids and the amount set by the physician. NPO means nothing by mouth, and thick wood liquids help us prevent choking. So if we force fluids, we're going to offer fluids in small quantities, and without being asked on every contact with a resident, you're going to ask them if they want something to drink. Remind the resident of the importance of fluids in their bodily functions. If we restrict fluids, you have to remind people that they can't have things to drink. Measure and record the exact amount of fluid that was taken in. Report any excesses to the nurse. Do not offer any additional fluid or foods that contain fluids. And tell the nurse if the resident complains of thirst. NPO stands for nada per os, or nothing by mouth. <clears throat> the resident is not allowed anything to eat or drink, 
and you never offer food or drink or water to a resident who is NPO. NPO residents will be getting IVs or tube feedings. Oftentimes NPO status is ordered before surgery. Thickened liquids improves the ability to control the fluids in the mouth and the throat and this is for residents with swallowing problems. If it's ordered it must be used with all all liquids. Do not offer water, a water pitcher, or any other liquids to a resident who must have thickened liquids. Three basic consistencies are nectar thick, which is like a thick juice such as tomato juice, honey thick, which pours slowly like honey, and pudding thick that has to be consumed with a spoon. So when we provide fresh drinking water, we need to make sure we do that periodically throughout the day. Encourage residents that are able to drink six to eight glasses daily if appropriate, and offer fluids on every encounter unless you should not be giving them any liquids. So pagophagia is a craving for ice or compulsive eating of ice. This is a form of pica, which is a condition in which people crave and eat non-food substances such as ice, chalk, paper, laundry soap, starch, their hair, dirt, clay, and or paint. There are several reports linking the craving of ice to iron deficiency anemia. In fact, there's even a website that talks about all about chewing ice, which also has a support group of its own. And a lot of times our residents crave ice. So when the resident asks for ice, go get it. So when we measure fluids, fluid is measured in milliliters, which is a metric measure. 30 milliliters equals one ounce. We do not use the abbreviation CC. you will need to remember that 30 milliliters equals one ounce. So physicians oftentimes will order intake and output. Intake includes anything that's taken in by the mouth, food items that could turn to liquid at room temperature, tube feedings into the stomach through the nose or the abdomen, and fluids that are given intravenously. Output includes urine, liquid stool, emesis, drainage, suction secretions, and excessive perspiration. So when we prepare somebody for a meal, we need to make it an enjoyable and social experience. Provide a pleasant environment which is clean, odor-free, and has adequate lighting. A lot of times you'll see flowers and decorations and music which add interest to the dining area. Because eating is a social activity of daily living, don't enclose a bedbound resident with privacy curtains when you feed them. All residents need to be clean and dressed for meals. Their hair should be combed. They should have had oral care. Encourage them to use the bathroom or the bedpan or urinal before we go to eat. Cleanse and dry incontinent residents. The resident's face and hands should be washed before a meal and rewashed after the meal. If the resident's staying in the bed, we need to make sure that we provide comfort and raise the head of the bed before feeding. We also need to make sure if they're in a chair that we position them appropriately in the chair. And if they're going in a wheelchair, we transport them in the wheelchair to a dining area. You also need to provide clothing protector if it's appropriate. Offer but don't insist that residents have the uh, residents use a clothing protector. Remember they have the right to refuse. Using the term bib decreases their dignity, makes you feel like you're treating them like a child. So check to make sure the resident receives the right tray and has the correct diet. Food should be attractive when it's served and placed within the reach of the resident. Check the tray to see that everything needed is there. Assist the resident if they need it with cutting the meat, pouring liquids, buttering bread, and open containers. So if you have a blind resident, you need to orient them to food placement on the plate according to the face of a clock. It should be to the resident's positioning, not yours. 
approach the resident from the non-affected side and alternate fluid and food. Residents should be encouraged to do as much as they can for themselves, provide time for them to complete their meal, and you should have a dis uh, display a pleasant attitude when you're assisting them. After the meal, remove the tray, tell the nurse what was not eaten, observe and record the amount that was eaten in a percentage. Record fluid intake if ordered and assist to position the patient for comfort. Make sure that you place the call bell within reach and the area should be left clean and tidy. Hands should be washed before and after the care of each resident. So supplementary nourishments are ordered by a physician and it's directed by the supervisor. It provides necessary eating utensils and it also gives our residents a snack. It's usually served mid-morning, mid-afternoon, and bedtime. And it's done on a schedule so that the meal is not jeopardized. Some things that are, t uh, the snack can be milk, juice, gelatin, custard, ice cream, sherbets, crackers. Sometimes we can give Ensure. And this concludes how we provide for residents' nutrition and hydration needs.